Um, this last uh, talk is sort of a mixture of several different things uh, that I'd like to talk about. First of all, we talked in the last uh, talk, we mentioned about uh, using forgiveness meditation in order to clear the path uh, away so that you can then practice the metta meditation or you can practice uh, the breath meditation. Uh, some people ask me why do we use the metta meditation and we use metta meditation because most people really need to use the metta meditation in their life right now and also because we see how much faster they make their progress uh, going through the different levels of understanding as they develop their practice and how easy it is for them uh, to learn the practice and uh, to um, immediately start to have a much deeper understanding of the Dhamma. So we've been talking a lot about the meditation and about uh, what the Buddha was doing, shifting from unwholesome to wholesome. And um, when we're teaching metta, we are not teaching it the same as much of what has been written about. And I just want to talk slightly, just a little bit about that. What we're actually teaching is called uh, breaking down of the barriers, and we're teaching the Brahma Viharas. So we are training people uh, in metta, which will naturally evolve from the heart area, okay, and move upward into the head, and then this will change naturally into a state of karuna, and then from there the person starts uh, experiencing some of the different states of the um, levels of understanding and some of the deeper states. And um, this evolves systematically on its own, a natural progression of metta and then karuna, the joy and the equanimity, the loving kindness, compassion, joy, and extreme balance as they develop their practice. Now, when the Buddha is talking in the uh, Subha Sutta, he is talking in the Majjhima Nikaya in reference to um, the, uh, the monks abiding, pervading one quarter of the mind imbued with loving kindness, and then the second, and likewise the third, and likewise the fourth, so above, below, and everywhere, and to himself. And he's doing this first with the loving kindness, but then he doesn't do it with the um, with the compassion until the compassion naturally evolves. The, we call it breaking down the barriers because gradually the person is using one spiritual friend when they are initially um, training this way, and they stay with one. Um, uh, spiritual friend, and this spiritual friend they're working with, uh, radiating the metta too, is a person of the same sex and not a family member, and it is a living person. And then they keep working at sending it to that person until that person smiles back at them. And when the person smiles back at them or they have some feeling the person has uh, reacted to the loving kindness, at that point then they come back to the teacher and we take them through a series slowly of the different kinds of persons who can be, the metta can be sent to with the teacher following along with them. And we can do this with a person across the internet um, and as long as they're truthfully telling us their reports and working with us, we can do this with the person across the internet step by step and we train the person to work with the terminology that we're using in discussing this, um, this, met this meditation. Now, teaching a person the terminology, one guy got very upset with me saying, well, why do we have to say it that way? Well, because when we're in France, we don't speak Spanish. And, and when we're in Germany, we don't speak Italian, <laughs> okay? And when you're coming to our center and you're working with the meditation the way we're teaching it, with the terminology that's very clear and easy to understand for the student, we just want you to learn those terminologies so that we can all communicate on the same page. Um, and then it makes it easy for us to stay in touch with you. It makes it easy for us to be able to coach you at a distance even if we are 
talking on the same level. So that's, that's how we're training, and the person has a unique experience with this metta over a period of time and the karuna once they come to understand that metta was not something to just visit and go um, through, you know, uh, it was, let's put it this way, metta was a power that needs to be developed. Karuna is the power. Joy is a power, and equanimity is certainly a power. You don't develop a power by going boom, 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 boom in 30 minutes and going home. This is like putting a cherry on top of the cake and saying that's what metta was. But metta permeates the texts hundreds of times in the Majjhima Nikaya versus eight times or nine times with the breast meditation. So the question becomes, what was the Buddha doing? What was he spending his time on? He was spending time on instructing his son how important it is to keep this metabhavana developed and keep using it. He was advising uh, Sariputta and Moggallana to be sure they were teaching the other uh, monks this practice that the stabilization you can acquire in the breath meditation is one kind of meditation for deep meditation work in a retreat but it's not so easy to solve life's problems but wi by using the metta the the uh, breath meditation as it is using the metta or the karuna because metta and karuna is a power and it's a power that is unbelievable you can walk into a room where everybody's angry, start turning on this power, and everybody in the room will become lambs instead of lions. And we've seen this happen. And we've seen people who are afraid to go in to get a raise, to talk to somebody, to get a raise and talk to their boss. They're assuming everything's going to go wrong and nothing's going to go right, and they've predetermined this ahead of time. But instead, we have them send the loving kindness towards those people until they go into the room and when they go in the room what happens is everything goes right and you end up getting everything you want and you leave and everybody's happy so you have to experience this to really understand how it's a power and it can shift people very easily if you go to youtube there are two films i always encourage people um, to look at and the one is called the bodhisattva and if you go, it's a story of a man who rode on a subway train. Go and see the Bodhisattva film. It's a very short film. It couldn't be more than 10 minutes long. It's really worth your time to understand the power of happiness, the power of a smile, the power of this metta permeating from someone and what can happen. And the other one, the other short film that I would really like you to see, if you don't think that you can affect the world around you, if you're determined that is not the case, <laughs> I want you to go see a film that is 17 minutes long and it's called Validation. You put that into the YouTube uh, lists or you can Google it. Validation is the name of this short film and it's amazing what a person can do for people by a simple act of kindness. And this is what you'll see happening in this film, in the story. So uh, having said that about, um, about this, uh, the power of metta is very remarkable and working with the single um, the single, the reason for working with a single spiritual friend is to develop your own feeling of the loving kindness in your heart, to get it to flow. If we practice loving kindness from the angle of a mantra, of just reading it and then going home, we feel great that we practiced metta. <laughs> but what did metta actually do? It didn't really do much. It didn't really do much. And over a long period of time, a lifetime of doing it this way, I think it softens the person. I think it makes them so they're kinder, yes, but it doesn't repower that metta has. So letting go of the mantra effect of metta, taking it back to actually learning how to release it. You have to have it first in yourself. I cannot give you this. It, this is a piece of a pen, I put it down, I cannot give it to you, right? 
I don't have it. But if I have it in my hand, I can give it to you. So I have to have metta for myself. I have to love myself before I can love other people. This is a very simple principle of I can't give it to you if I don't have it. So that's a simple one. Now, the power of meditation in life can be measured in a lot of different ways. Um, one of the interesting points is about equanimity. Equanimity, what is that? Now, we have some oh, interesting ideas about equanimity. One commentary says equanimity happens in the fourth jhana. That's it. It's where it happens. And the reality of practice is you can't get into the first jhana if you don't have a reasonable degree of equanimity. And I look at it, I finally got a way of explaining it to people if I take my hand and I say to get in the first jhana you have to have this much equanimity it has to be something is it's not just loose it's it's standing on something the second jhana can be experienced with a two-legged sort of uh, equanimity okay the third jhana is experienced with a three-legged equanimity. It's getting firmer and the fourth jhana is experienced with a very stable four-footed equanimity. That's where the equanimity is strong enough. So that particular equanimity is what happens in the fourth jhana. We're not saying something doesn't significantly happen in the fourth jhana. It does. Because when you get this four-footed solid equanimity, very solid, you are then ready to go through the immaterial jhanas, these rupa jhanas, you progress through in one way, and the arupa jhanas, which are the immaterial jhanas, you progress through those only if you have this very, very firm equanimity, and then you can start experiencing things like the base of infinite space or the base of infinite consciousness, base of nothingness, neither perception or non-perception. You have to be able to have this very, very, very strong base in order for that to happen. Now, some people have said that, uh, I was listening the other night and I heard someone say, you know, um, meditation is not something that these athletes can say uh, that, that they're doing meditation uh, when they talk about flow in, in, uh, medi in, in the process of athletic activity. They can't call that meditation. They can't call it, say that has anything to do with Buddhist meditation. I take an issue with this because I think I think I don't really take an issue with the statement. I think there's a there's a missing link here in the in the transposition of English in understanding how to express ourselves about this because when a person practices Buddhist meditation and they establish this kind of equanimity and stability then it is easy for them to, easier for them to go and transport that kind of stability into a sport into an art form into almost anything that you do in life and then the person has the chance to experience what Shishisanitsin called the flow he wrote a book called the flow what is this flow that he spoke about was that the mind is totally and completely here in the present moment when I'm skiing or when I'm riding a bike or when I'm sailing a boat my mind is totally and completely in flow and no one can talk about flow unless they have actually experienced it they cannot speak about it properly I have experienced it in in riding uh, cycling uh, about 10 years back now, but cycling long distances of 100 or more miles and getting in flow and being able to completely keep going without any disturbance and the whole world disappears and there's nothing there but the bicycle and nothing there but the pedaling and the body in perfect alignment with what's happening. And when these football players or cyclists or skiers 
or swimmers or sailors talk about these things. We are not saying this is not a quote unquote byproduct of Buddhist meditation, and it is a byproduct of any form of meditation can prepare you for this. Certainly, the Buddhist meditation was an attempt to refine the way that we are able to focus and do whatever we do in our life. I think we'd all agree on that. So I think we can say it might not be something that is the Buddha's actual meditation, but we can all be happy if we just say it's a reasonable byproduct of the Buddhist meditation. And that's meeting everybody halfway and saying, yes, it's a byproduct of meditation to be able to experience this flow. I will tell you what is mentioned in the, um, in the text, and this is the idea of the super mundane Nibbana, which is a more permanent uh, experience than the mundane Nibbana, and that there is a mundane experience, and there is a super mundane experience. So what is the, um, the mundane experience like in, um, in, our, in our practice? When you look at how we told you a very simple practice, of using uh, right effort, and we talked about the, uh, the idea that you recognize when there is a tension and tightness in your mind, something pulling you away. And then you move your attention over to that. And we say, but you realize you've done it at some point, and so you release that, and you just leave it there, and you relax, and then you come back over to your um, object of meditation, and whatever it is eventually fades away, falls away, and so it's not there anymore. Whatever it was, you, you didn't stop what you were doing. You can test this whole thing and say, but wait a minute, I'm in charge, <laughs> okay? Well, wait a second, maybe you're not, <laughs> okay? Um, what you can test this by saying, okay, I'm sitting on a couch and I'm reading a book. And that's what I'm doing. I am reading this book. And then all of a sudden, a depressive thought comes up. And the question you need to say about a depressive thought is, well, wait a second. Did I stop reading the book and decide, well, I haven't been depressed today yet. I need to have this depressive thought. <laughs> Oh, here, I'll make it come up, and uh, now I'm going to grab hold of it, and <laughs> I'm going to get really involved, and I'm going to really have an emotional upheaval and leave the room and go to sleep. Um, that's not how this works. So what we need to uh, uh, look at is how did that happen? How did it actually happen? If you are doing some kind of a task, and that's where your attention is, these thoughts come up on their own. You do not have anything to do with them. That means these, uh, these dispositions or these uh, formations that float up, these thought objects, mind objects, are just arising on them themselves. So where we do have a little bit of choice is to crave or cl crave and cling or not to crave and cling. That is the question. <laughs> this is just like Shakespeare, you know? To crave and cling or not to crave and cling, that is the question. Do we choose to become involved with what arose? Okay, do we choose to grab a hold of it and not like it and think about all the reasons we don't like it and it's reminding of us of what? It's reminding us usually of the past. It's reminding us of the past. Or it's something we're worried about in the future and it's popping up because of that. Let's let go of that. The mundane experience sits like this. When something does come up and you reach over and you grab a hold of it, when you release it and you relax 
and this fades away. And then you smile and return. Right there, right here, in this little space where you relax and you return over, there is a tiny, brief, oh so small, cessation of suffering that you can see and experience enough to confirm for you that there is such a thing as the cessation of suffering. And what is the cessation of suffering? The cessation of suffering is the cessation of craving and feeling. I'm sorry, craving and clinging. I'm, think, I'm feeling tired here. <laughs> the cessation of craving and clinging. And that, the cessation of craving and clinging, is the cessation of suffering, is a tiny cessation point of a cessation state. This is Neroda. But it's a brief, I'm right here, okay, bye. <laughs> That's what it is. It's, a gr it's not, I've reached Neroda and here I am. <laughs> okay. It is just a brief, you just saw me, okay, bye. That's what it is. But it's big enough for you to understand that it is real. So, the reason I'm pointing this out to you is one of the things that we forget sometimes is that in the process of our development, we go through a stage where confidence comes up. It's a point on, there was a chart that I showed a little bit earlier. I showed a chart that showed the development in the Upanisa Sutta. And in that development, in that development, there was a point called knowledge and vision of how things actually are. When you experience that, you begin to grasp, you begin to understand that every single thing that arises when you're in meditation is happening the same way. Mind is meeting a mind object. Mind consciousness is arising. The meeting of the three is mind contact. With mind contact as condition, mind feeling is coming up, felt as pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. Now, with this pleasant feeling, if you delight in it, welcome it, and remain holding to it, then the underlying tendency to lust is inside of you. And if the painful feeling arises, and you sorrow, grieve, and lament, and weep, beating one's breast, and become distraught, well then the underlying tendency to aversion is in you. If a neither painful nor pleasant feeling arises, and you don't understand how this originated, the origination, the disappearance, how it disappears, the gratification, the danger, and the escape, if you don't understand that, then the underlying tendency to ignorance lies within you. Hopefully, since I taught you a bunch of these little vignettes, maybe I helped you get rid of a little bit of ignorance. <laughs> maybe I gave you enough knowledge to get rid of a little bit of, of ignorance. And you're looking now at how this actually works. Because it's really exciting, okay? What happens then is uh, that one shall here and now make an end to suffering without abandoning the underlying tendency to the lust for pleasant feeling, without abolishing the underlying tendency towards painful feeling, without taking up by the root these neither painful nor pleasant feelings, without abandoning, abolishing ignorance and arousing true knowledge, it is impossible for you to alleviate your suffering. But if you do let go of these lustful feelings, if you do let go of these painful feelings, if you do let go and understand how things are happening, relax and watch how things are actually coming into being without you. And you don't have anything to do with it. And it's not you. That means a lot of things. If this we're talking about depression, it means it's not your depression. 
It means you can't blame yourself or feel guilty if the depression comes up. It means that this is just happening. An anatta arising is happening, and it isn't anything to do with you, with atta. Witnessing this um, atta and anatta, the difference between atta and anatta, just before I, before I leave, I want to show you one more thing. Um, the question is the power of mind. Do we really believe in the power of mind? We have a lot of fun with this and examining it and testing it and walking around in the forest where I am and working with the tractor or working in the garden or working anywhere, you know, um, working on things and watching how everything works with the animals, with the people, with everything. And we get stung by bees and we get bitten by insects and all kinds of things, yeah, these experiences. And one of the things we realized was, if you have a bee sting you, or you hit yourself with a hammer, for instance, if I just take my hand and I just hit myself with a hand, if I start thinking about the sensation from hitting myself, it will stay there on the clock, on the table, it will stay there, the pain will stay there longer if I think about it, put my attention on it. But I can take the same thing a few p minutes later and, and watch the second hand come around and I can just go wham like that and then I can walk away uh, or just start thinking about something or pick up a book and start reading it and the pain is instantly gone. How's that work? What is this mind-body connection that's happening? The mind-body connection is one of the basis of the teachings in, uh, uh, with the Buddha, and it's one of the most fascinating things for you and me to experiment with, to, to try to examine and see how exactly it works. If you have an accident, if you're ill, if you end up in the hospital for any reason, if you have any kind of pain, I'll tell you a funny story very quickly. The Buddha has a wonderful expose in um, the Chichaka Sutta. He has a wonderful expose. Uh, the Chichaka Sutta was actually, it's called the Six Sets of Six, and it was set up to explain to you how Atta comes into being and how Anatta perspective can be developed. So he talks about the, um, the, the origination of personality and the monk is saying about his eyes, his ears, and all six of his senses. he's walking around saying, I regard the I thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. He regards forms thus, this is me, this is mine, this is myself. He regards the, uh, the I consciousness, the contact, the feeling, and the craving. This is me, this I am, this is myself. But, he says, the uh, underlying, uh, the cessation, cessation of this personality can come about. This is the way leading to the cessation of personality, he says, and he gives the monks a simple drill. Walk around in the forest and regard the I thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Regard the forms thus. This is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. And, and so on and so forth. So I had a car accident in Indonesia before I came here. And I'm in the hospital and I'm lying on a gurney and they're ready to take me into the x-ray and I was a little bit funny, you know, kind of hurting in my neck and laying there and the teacher walks over and Bunty Bimala Ramsey walks over and he leans over and he says, recite the sutta. Recite the sutta? He <laughs> said, recite the sutta, the section on personality. So I started to recite it and I got to the part about the cessation of personality. I'm lying on the gurney saying, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. And all of a sudden it dawned on me as I'm going through these pieces and I started to say, this neck, this pain, this is not me, this is not myself, this is not, this is not who I am. And I started to recite this, the nurse came over and said, what are you doing? I said, this pain, it is not mine, it is not me, it is not myself. So you tell me we can't use this in life. I was using it in life and I had everybody in the x-ray room smiling. Anyway, I'm going to let you go now. It was a very good pleasure for me to talk to you all about uh, Buddhism, to have the chance to come to Metta Vihari's uh, studio, uh, you know, Reverend Metta Vihari's studio, the Dhamma Vahini, 
studio. And the people here are marvelous. I thank all of you on behalf of United International Buddha Dhamma Society and the Dhamma Sukha Meditation Center. I hope that you'll come and visit us, but you have all the fruit here, so I don't know, maybe you'll stay here in Sri Lanka. <laughs> but I do hope that I can come and visit you again. It's been a pleasure, and I just want to say thank you very much. And remember, smile, and then give that smile away and make someone else happy. Thank you. <laughs>